songbook. Let's start by singing together. 327, 327 springs of living water. All right, go ahead and grab that songbook. 327. Let's all stand together. Brother Bible leads. Good to see you tonight, and uh, boy, I tell you what, stay like this all winter as far as I'm concerned, and uh, be in shirt sleeves on December 9, I'll take that, amen? December 9, let's see, is anybody's birthday today? Thelma Blystone, is it your birthday? You, you, you gave them up, is that what you said? Oh, no, don't do that. Happy birthday to Thelma. All right, make sure you say happy birthday. Should we sing happy birthday to her? Yeah, I guess we should. You got it there, Lisa? Got that on call all the time? That's exciting. And you're in church on your birthday. How about that? All right, let's hear you sing. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday. That's great. That's great, Tom. I hope you had a great day, and uh, good to see you in church tonight. That's great. All right. Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father, thank you for a wonderful opportunity for us to gather together again here in the middle of the week. Thank you for Wednesday night church. Lord, it's great to get together with the family of God in this place, and thank you for the faithfulness of people to be in their place on Wednesday night. And Lord, we pray your blessing now in our service here. Bless the children's clubs as they meet as well uh, here this evening. Lord, I pray that our hearts will be open and our ears attentive to what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening. Use the service in each of our lives to mold us and make us into vessels of honor for you. We love you. We ask you to speak to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, let's turn over to 133 in our hymnal. One, three, three angels we have heard on high. One, three, three. Let's sing that first together. Angels we have heard.
for caroling that's great <laughs> all right um those of you watching live stream we're gonna cut away for a minute or at least cut the sound out for a minute uh the missionary letter we're reading tonight is not something that needs to go out over the internet and so uh we're gonna uh nothing's wrong with your computer uh we're we're uh shutting it down for a minute so brother jason come and uh read the letter from our missionaries uh this evening Exciting. Um, some of you probably asked the barber to do the same thing for you, but hasn't worked, has it? And uh, put some extra hair up there. All right. Well, listen. Uh, take your prayer guide tonight. Anybody uh, need one? Anybody didn't get in, got in, and didn't grab one? We'll get it to you right now. Everybody good? Okay. Um, start on the back. You need. Diana Earhart. Okay. All right. Okay, that's Diana Earhart on the cancer. Okay. On the coming events list is where we'll start. And uh, pray for the Are You Inside tomorrow night down at the CRC prison. And, uh, of course, Friday night right here at the church with the Are You program here. Saturday morning back out to London this week. And uh, then, of course, our... Soul winning and bus visitation at 10. Don't forget, teens, your Christmas dinner is at 5 p.m. on uh, this coming Saturday evening, 5 to 8 p.m. at the church. 
Uh, there's no charge for that, but they do want you to bring a gift uh, that can be for a girl or a boy. Uh, gift exchange, and you're going to have a good time together Saturday evening uh, here at the church. And I think you're going to have a special guest appearance by somebody, so you won't want to miss that. And uh, that'll be a surprise. Okay, then um, let's see. Sunday, don't forget Sunday will be the Christmas play, the children's Christmas play at 545 on Sunday evening. That's always a delightful time. We look forward to seeing the children's children do their Christmas play Sunday evening, all right? The 19th is our church-wide caroling. That's Saturday from 10 to noon, and um, we'll come back and have some uh, cookies, probably some sloppy joes and chips, because I think the choir has their dress rehearsal at 1 that day, from 1 to 3. So uh, getting ready for their cantata on the 20th, the richest family in town, okay? So that'll be great and a uh, busy time for us there, okay? Inside your list, the praise reports, we uh, thank for Christina, who was baptized on Sunday, and uh, 34 at CRC last Thursday night, and 11 of those men received Christ as their Savior. Uh, good, good night down there. Continue to pray for the different uh, ministries and what the Lord is doing here uh, through Bible Baptist Church, and then, of course, these on the health list and uh, the, those in authority. Uh, we continue to pray for those in our military, these who are battling uh, cancer. Another name to add uh, on the cancer list there, if you would, uh, add Carrie Keen. That's K-E-R-R-Y. I mean, Kern, K-E-R-N. Can't read my own writing. All right, Carrie Kern. He should be on there. And so put him on, if you would, please. And um, we'll then, of course, pray for these on the salvation list and those in the unreached people groups and then our missionaries as well, especially tonight. Uh, pray for these folks who we mentioned in the restricted country, okay? All right? And uh, we'll remember those in prayer. All right? And let's see. I'm going to have Brother Yoder come and pray for us this evening, if you would, Brother Dave. Appreciate you doing that. And uh, Brother Yoder will lead us audibly as he prays audibly for us. And uh, let's pray along silently with him. But let's unite our hearts together in prayer, okay? Amen. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for allowing us to come to you tonight and bring these requests to you. Uh, Lord, we are humbled when we think of all these requests by how needy we are. And but Lord, uh, many of these people on this list are friends and family. So we'd ask that you'd intervene in a great way. We need your help, and so that's what we're asking for tonight. We do thank you for the good report from this missionary. Lord, you know their name. I'm not sure whether I should mention it right now, but uh, we thank you for the good report that we heard. And we'd ask that you'd continue to work with that family so that they'd have a great impact in the area that they're at. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we do... Uh, come before you and, and ask for this name that was uh, presented here concerning the cancer, this uh, Diana Earhart. I pray that you'd please uh, use uh, this lady uh, to be reached for you. And if she's already saved, Lord, that uh, her testimony would, would be something that would help others with the same situation. I do pray for this Carrie Kern that you'd help there as well. And again, Lord, this is uh, something that uh, uh, many of us will face. Some are facing it now. Some that uh, are here that have family that are part of this cancer list. And, Lord, we're, we're asking that you would heal them. But more than that, we pray that your will would be done. Sometimes your wisdom uh, is so far beyond ours, we just can't understand so I pray, Lord, that you'd help us be patient and rely and trust on you. We thank you for this good report concerning uh, the prison ministries, both here uh, uh, locally and then in London, uh, for those that have received you as personal Savior. We thank you, Lord, that even uh, if, if things do not change for them, that we will be together with you in eternity. And so I pray, Lord, you'd keep using the men of our church to reach these people. We thank you for the things that are done during the RU program and how it's growing as well. We'd ask for your continued uh, hand upon that. 
Lord, we would ask for those that are in authority, not just locally here in Grove City, but in our state and in our nation. Uh, we need your help in a great way. I pray, Lord, that our leaders would turn to you for wisdom, uh, quit using their own uh, head for counsel and for uh, the, the things that you've given them and turn to you. Uh, without you, we're nothing, and I pray, Lord, that they would not forget that. I'd ask, Lord, that you'd be with these unreached people groups. Lord, at times we think that it's uh, impossible, but, Lord, that's where you shine the most. And I pray that uh, we would be able to soon have missionaries there. I pray that we'd soon have translations of the Bible. I pray that many people would be reached before it's eternally too late. Again, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to this place, uh, Bible Baptist Church here in Grove City. We'd ask that you'd be with our leaders, particularly our pastor and Brother Bob, that you'd empower them and help them. And, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts tonight through your word. We love you, and we thank you for allowing us to be here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 141-40, the first Noel. Let's all stand together as you fight. 140 on that first together. The first Noel.
that last all together. Then seated ushers will come and we'll get our offering tonight and i i should have mentioned that um carrie kern is carrie and shelly kern they used to go to church here at bible baptist and uh i think they were did they have something to do with you and we were just friends of you and k or did they have something yeah. with you two getting together yes to both of those or yes all right so oh, all right the matchmaker Feel free to just speak out, okay? It's all right. <laughs> what about it? Who's in charge of this meeting anyway? <laughs> all right. So that's, uh, might want to know that and uh, keep them in prayer. And some of you, some of you have been here for a while, you'll know who they are. And um, please, please pray for them. I know they would appreciate that. All right. Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege to give and thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed us and prospered us. And I pray, Lord, that in all the giving that we do uh, here in this Christmas season to those whom we love and care about, we certainly would not leave you off that list and make sure that you should be at the top of that list, that we would certainly want to make sure that we give to you during this season. And so, Father, bless the offering tonight. Use it for your glory and for your honor. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, take your Bible this evening, if you would, please. Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14. Beginning with verse number 6, the Bible says, In the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. Yet, as yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. 
As my strength was then, even so is my strength now. For war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenazite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before with Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we uh, look at this man named Caleb, Lord, his life and uh, the characteristics, Lord, that I think set him apart. I pray that you would put a desire in our heart that we would have the characteristics that Caleb had in his life, the, the, that brought your favor upon him. That Lord, we would have these in our life and see your favor upon our lives as well. Bless our study to this evening. Now I pray in Christ's name. Amen. If, if somebody asks you the question, does God have favorites how would you respond to that be careful all right uh now for, let's make it clear he loves everybody and he loves everybody unconditionally he god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and and we know that he doesn't show partiality to any one person or to any one particular nation he calls people out of every nation, Acts 10 and verse 34. And yet, when you read the scripture, you can't help but see that God is uh, drawn to certain individuals more than others. You can't, uh, you can't say, in other words, God has shown some men favor that maybe he didn't show to others or gave certain blessings to some that he did not give to others. Was God drawn to Noah and his family? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Anybody else? <laughs> no, Noah, his family, that's it. And grace is God's undeserved favor, is it not? That's undeserved favor of God. And, and, and he, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What was it about Abraham? Did Abraham and God have a special relationship? Yeah, James 2 tells us Abraham was called the friend of God. No one else called that in the Bible. What was there about Abraham that gave him special favor with God that wasn't shared with anybody else? Joseph was particularly blessed by God and used by God. Even through the, the, the difficult path that God uh, had, had him go to rise to power in Egypt. But can you doubt God had a special plan for David, the shepherd boy of Israel, to become the king of Israel and become a man after God's own heart? What about all the virgins that would have been in Israel during the time of when it came time for the angel to God to pick a, a virgin to bear the Christ child? He chose Mary. Hail, thou art highly favored among women. Favored uh, uh, among all the others. Why was Mary favored? So, so as you begin to, to look at that, I think we can see that God will favor certain people over others. Now the question would be, why? And if he does, how can I get in on that? How can I get in on being one of the favored ones? How can I uh, secure God's favor? And Caleb, I think, was one of those that enjoyed the favor of God. And I think we look at Caleb, and I think we'll see in him the characteristics that bring God's favor in our life. And back in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, if you look back there, we were in Joshua 14. Look at Numbers 14, and in verse number 24. Numbers 14, verse 24. Here's what the Bible says. But my servant Caleb... Because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, 
Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed to possess it. That's God speaking now uh, about uh, Caleb, my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land. And in that, that verse and in that statement, I think we see three qualities and three reasons why God favored Caleb. Okay? Number one, I see that Caleb was a servant. Notice what he said. Verse 24, But my servant Caleb. He was a servant. Now the first time you're introduced to Caleb is in chapter 13, and that's where they're choosing out the men to go spy out the promised land. They're choosing one man out of every tribe. And, and they're going to send men to spy out the land of Canaan. The Bible says everyone would be a chief among them. And out of the tribe of Judah was selected Caleb. He would be the one representing that tribe to spy out the promised land. The elite spy organization that went in to check it out uh, before they would go in to possess it. So he was a leader in the tribe of Judah. Out of all the men chosen out of the tribe, he was one out of, out of possibly, there, there, there are all kinds of different estimates of how many Jews there actually were. Some say anywhere, anywhere from about 1.5 million up to as many as 3 million. But they only chose 12 and he was one of those. That's pretty heady stuff, isn't it? Uh, if you were in a, uh, you know, imagine out of that many million of people and you were one of the 12 chosen, you were especially to represent your tribe, uh, that would be pretty much to, it could blow your head up. Okay, get you thinking you're pretty important and that you're pretty special. And yet, uh, Caleb, when God looked at his heart, he said, it's Caleb, my servant. Caleb didn't get the big head. He didn't get to thinking he was something. Uh, he was one of those uh, special people who understood that, the, that, that the, uh, the power of a position didn't come from lording it over others, but it came by serving others. He understood that when I, when I become a leader, it means I humble myself to serve those who I lead. You want God's favor? Learn to be a servant. That gives, that secures God's favor. Husbands, you want to get favor of God? Become a servant in your home. Become a servant leader at home. Fathers, do you want to be favored by God? Then be a servant leader to your children. It's not lording over somebody. It's not, it's not saying, bless God, woman, submit. That's what you're supposed to do to me. No, 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 no. You see, and, and you're never going to get God's favor doing that. But besides, you're to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay? Gave himself for it. So you have to be favored by God. Christian, you want to be favored by God? Then be a servant a servant leader to those who God has entrusted you with. Not lording over them, but serving them. See, when, when, when you're a true servant, you don't say, well, well, what do they think I am, a slave? Yeah. That's what we are. That's what, that's what we're supposed to be. Oh, I mean, you know, I don't expect everybody to just walk right over me. Yeah. Just serve. That's what servants do. Servants serve. You can, tell, you can tell whether you're a servant by how you respond when you get treated like one. And if you bristle and you, your hair stands up on the back of your neck, you got, you got some work to do. God has some work to do in our lives to get us to be servants. But that's who God favors. Ladies, you want to be favored by God? Then be a Servant leader to your family. That servant leader is the one who is favored by God. Now, how does that happen? Hold your finger there in the Old Testament or put something in there, a piece of paper. But I want you to go to the New Testament and look at the book of Philippians. Will you go there, please? 
Philippians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. If you hit Colossians, you went too far. Come back. All right, Philippians chapter 2. Notice what it says in verse number 3. Philippians 2 and verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, what mind? That nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That you have a lowly mind. That you esteem other better than yourself. That you look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, because where was that mind? It was in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And listen to me. He was God. He could have come and rightfully demanded that everybody serve Him. But Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. I didn't come to be served. He came to serve. And He was God. Who are we? To think that we, should, that we need to be served. Be a servant. Get the mindset. Get, get, get the same mind that Christ Jesus had. It's putting, putting other people's interests ahead of your own. Putting other people's needs ahead of my own. I wonder how much better our homes would be if we would just put everybody else's needs ahead of our own. Oh, sometimes, it's, sometimes we're good at that at work are at church, but then we get home and we're pretty selfish. Well, that's quiet. All of a sudden it's, uh, it's what I want, I'm sitting down, I'm being quiet, man, leave me alone, you know. And, and all of a sudden we can get real selfish. wonder how much better our homes could be if husbands and wives and children would have this kind of spirit. To say, I'd like to be a servant. wonder how much better our churches could be if everybody had this kind of a spirit. Just be willing to serve. Willing to help. We, you know what? We'd be better off because we'd all have God's favor. God favored Caleb. And he was a servant. He humbly served others. As God's servant leader. He was a leader in Judah. He didn't say I'm the boss. Everybody do something for me. <laughs> he just served. And God saw his heart. God knew what Caleb was. And he called him his servant. He called him his servant. So I believe he was, he was favored by God because he was a servant. The second thing we see in the verse from Numbers chapter 14. Is that Caleb was different. He was different. He had a different spirit about him. When you go to Numbers 14, and the spies have come back with their report, they, in fact, they've, they've already given the bad report at the end of chapter 13. Verse 1 of chapter 14, notice what it says. All the congregation lift up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And what happened? Well, they began to murmur against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Be careful what you ask for. Huh. They're gonna, God's going to answer that prayer. And, and wherefore, the Lord hath brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey, we're not better for us to return to Egypt. And they said one to another, Let us make a captain. Let us return into Egypt. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And that doesn't mean they gave them to somebody for some money. It means they tore their clothes, okay? 
sign of great grief and concern. And they spake unto the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we have passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then He will bring us into this land and give it us a land that floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Oh, and here you see the, the different spirit that Caleb and Joshua had compared to the rest of the children of Israel. They had a different spirit about it. And, and you, you can look at, you can read the report at the end of chapter 13 and you, you'll find that they talk about, they both come back and say it's a good land and then immediately the other ten start talking about the giants and the fenced cities and how big everybody is and, and how hard it is and how difficult the land will be and, and, and they're, they're, they're having a, a difficult time. And then Caleb and Joshua stand up and they're different. What made them different? different. I'll tell you what made them different is they brought God into the conversation. They brought God into the conversation. In fact, I, I have it. Uh, the, the very last verse, they, uh, ver chapter 13, verse 33, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which were come of the giants, and we were in, what's the next three words? Our own sight as grasshoppers and so we were, what's the last three words? So we have our sight and we have their sight. Whose sight are you missing? God's sight. What about God? Where's God in all this? They had no thought that God wasn't in the conversation. Until Joshua and Caleb noticed when they start talking. If the Lord delight in us, verse 8, chapter 14... Then, then He'll bring us into this land. Verse 9, Only rebel ye not against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land. He said, They're bred, they're bred for us. Their defense is parted from them. The Lord is with us. Man, they're just they're focusing on the Lord. That made them different than several million others. <laughs> Pretty amazing. And so they, they, they knew. Listen, because God was ruling in their heart. God was in their heart. He also was on their lips. It's out of the abundance of the, of the heart that the mouth speaks. You know what? You just, if we could follow you around for 24 hours with a tape recorder and record everything you say for 24 hours, we'll be able to tell you what's in your heart. Because your speech will betray that. Would, you, would there be a lot of talk about God? Would there be a lot of talk about Jesus? What's in your heart? What set him apart was God was there. And what's in his heart came out of his mouth. And their focus was on the Lord. And there's no doubt we as Christians are to be different people. The Bible says we're peculiar people. We're, we're, that doesn't mean you're odd, though we're odd to the world. It means we're, we're special to God. We've been, we've been set apart to Him. And our outlook on life is different than the outlook of the world. Someone who doesn't know God. Someone who does not have God in their heart. And because our outlook is different, our priorities are different. And when our priorities are different, then our activities are different. My actions are different. And that means my moral and ethical standards are going to be different from those who don't have God in their heart. Different than the world. You hear all the time that, that we're to be different from the world in the things we do. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by your mind. And usually, usually what follows that is you know, the list of things that we shouldn't do to be like the world. And nothing's wrong with that. But here, he's not just talking about the outward things we do. He's talking about a different spirit in Caleb. A different spirit within Joshua. Where they saw God in everything. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And what that means, not that they'll see God. He's saying they see God in everything. 
You begin, when your heart's pure in the sight of God, you see God working everywhere. And you'll see God in every situation. Because He is in every situation. He is working in everything. And then you'll begin to see that. And you have a different spirit about it. I see the things that are happening in the world. But listen, there's, as a, as, as a uh, believer, and by the way, don't, don't, don't think... I think one of the hard things we're going to have in the American church is, is separating our, 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 our belief and in, in what we should look at as a believer from what we look at as an American. They're not the same. Some of the things I want to do as an American are really, in, in reality, contrary to the Scripture. <laughs> but this, you know who's in charge of the whole thing? God is. And so when I, when I get the right outlook, I'll say, you know what? Hey, God, is all this that's going on, it seems like it's crazy and it seems like it's wild and what is happening and everybody's thinking, what, what's happening in this world? And you know who, who shouldn't be panicking or who shouldn't be wondering? God's people shouldn't be. We say, God, you know what's happening? It's all going just the way God said it would. It'll happen just the way God said it'll happen. And God, none of this, none of this that's happened, none of the killings, none of the ISIS, right? None of that stuff makes God say, uh oh. God never says, uh oh. God never says, look at that. <laughs> wow, I didn't see that coming. You know, God, God, it's all being orchestrated by God. He knows what He's doing. And so I, I, we can have a good spirit. Don't, don't get caught up into the world. Listen. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're to therefore glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. How's your spirit? You ought to have a different spirit about you. Okay? And, and so, have a different spirit. He was just different, and they knew it in his attitudes. When, when they tried to, I think of Daniel, when they tried to find fault with Daniel, remember? They followed him around, and, and, and by the way, one of the problems was, you read about it in Daniel, that he had an excellent spirit. Man, they couldn't say, man, you know, when he gets in the break room, he talks about the king too. He says, he says rotten things about management. Or he criticizes the workers. You know, they, never, they couldn't get him by complaining or grumbling or griping or, or saying things he shouldn't say, listening to something he shouldn't listen to. They, they said, man, and you know what? He's just such a good spirit. You try to say something bad about somebody to him, and he just turns around and says something good. What a, and they couldn't find any fault. You know the biggest fault they found? He prays three times a day. Wow. Now, now I don't know if there's anybody in this room that could stand up to that scrutiny. I know the guy you're listening to couldn't. That's amazing. But I want that spirit. I want to have that kind of a spirit. And that's the kind of spirit Caleb had, and I think Joshua had as well. But he, was, he, was, he, he brought God to the conversation. Because God was in his heart. It changed his spirit. And he had a, he had a good spirit. You know, it's something to bring God into our life. We've said this before. What the world wants is, you know what? They don't mind if you're in church on Wednesday night. They don't mind if you're in church on Sunday morning. Just leave it at church, would you? You're not going to bring that, you know, you're not going to bring that into the office and make decisions. Oh, absolutely you are. I've read, I read uh, some of the book by uh, uh, George Bush, not the dad, but the son. And he talks about the struggles with certain decisions he had to make. And recently, one of those uh, ladies who worked in the White House, uh, Dana, is that her name, Perino or something like that? She worked for President Bush. She said, we had prayer every morning in the White House. And I know that he prayed and asked for God's guidance and asked for God's wisdom on the decisions that he had to make. Now, I'm not saying he makes all the right decisions, but I'm thankful that he wanted to seek God about it. Thankful that he wanted to pray and try to get God, God's perspective on it. And so I want to, listen, when, when God is in your heart, 
He's in, it, 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 our heart, out of our heart are the issues of life. And so God's involved in all every part of my life. Can't, can't not help but be. And we want to bring that in the conversation. It's amazing. You'd be surprised. Maybe you wouldn't. But you'd be surprised how many folks who, who are in church on a Sunday but really don't think much about God the rest of the week. Well, how can I, how can I make God a part of my life? Years talk about make us mindful of your presence. Pray that prayer. Be aware that God is there. Or one of the ways you, you bring God in the conversation, you bring him in at home. You've heard me say, and I don't think this is on your paper, but you talk about him at home, you know, You've often heard me say, if your Christianity is not good at home, it's not any good. Every time God, when, when He dealt with being filled with the Spirit, when He dealt with living as a Christian ought to live, He always starts at home. He starts where you live. And those words in the Old Testament, He said, listen, uh, remember the hero Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord? And He said, you're going to teach these diligently your children. You're going to talk about them when you lay down, when you rise up, when you walk by the way, when you're going to be, all day long. You're to talk about him in your home. Is God part of your conversation at home? One uh, uh, student in Sunday school said, well, his parents don't talk about God at home. They're just too busy. Well, that's awful sad, isn't it? It's supposed to be a Christian home. How do you get the favor of God at home if you never talk about God at home? If you never bring God into the conversation at home? We need to bring God in the area, and I think this may be your notes. You need to bring God in the area, area of our conversation and our plans. Plans that we make. How many times do we plan things and don't even think about God? What did James tell us? James says, we should say, if the Lord wills, I'll do this or I'll do that. We're so easy to say, yep, I'll be there. Hey, let's do this. Yeah, you know what we're going to do next year? Huh. But we're so quick to just, just throw it out there and, and without giving thought, if the Lord will. i got news for you. If God's not willing for it to happen, it ain't happening. And God can change our plans, amen? Paul told the people in Acts 18, it's in Him, in God, that we live and move and have our being. It's a matter of us recognizing that we live for His will. Do we live for our will? No, that henceforth, but Peter said, you, show, you don't live the rest of your time in the flesh now that you're saved. You don't live the rest of the time in your flesh to the, to the lust of the flesh, but to the will of God. Now, I want to do what He wants me to do. I'm going to live how He wants me to live. Whenever there's a situation, you say, God, what's your will in this matter? What do you want? And I want to do what God wants. And it's okay to let other people know. Hey, I don't care if the person's saved or unsaved. You say, you know what? Lord willing, I'll be there. And make sure that they know that God's involved in your life and you're concerned about doing God's will. And you also bring God in the conversation of your life with thanksgiving. And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Oftentimes, we're good at giving God thanks in private, but we're not so good at giving Him thanks in public. I don't think Caleb was different just because he kept God in his heart. I think he was different because God was on his lips. Give God thanks in front of others. Two scriptures to look at. Will you look at them with me? First one is Psalm 35. The 35th Psalm. Are you doing all right? Everybody okay? Psalm 35. It's good to study the Bible. Psalm 35. Notice what the psalmist says here, David. Psalm 35, verse 18. Here he says, I will give thee thanks, where? In the great congregation, I will praise thee among much people. 
I'm, I'm going to thank you in the assembly of your people. I'm going to thank you. And, and by the way, it's good to thank the Lord when you're with other believers. That's, that's a good way to provoke one another unto love and good works. By hearing somebody thank God and praise the Lord. And, and, and that's a good thing to do. And that's the easiest place to do it. But he's not done. Look over to, to uh, Psalm 18. Turn back to Psalm 18. And look in Psalm 18 and verse number 49. Therefore will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, where? Among the heathen. And sing praises unto thy name. Oh, uh, I'm giving thanks now, but it's not in front of the believer. It's in front of the unbeliever. I'm giving thanks to God among the heathens. I'm going to still praise His name. Those who are not in fellowship with God, they'd be outside the fellowship of God. And maybe if we decided to give thanks in front of those who don't believe in God and don't consider God in their life, maybe they'd be asking us a reason of the hope that lies within us. Maybe that would begin some conversations. It takes... Listen... It takes some courage from God to be different in a world that demands conformity. As much as the world says, be yourself, you know what they want? They want everybody to be the same. You know what, you know what Donald Trump's popularity is? His popularity is he's not the normal guy running for president. He has come out with saying that let's just stop all the Muslim immigrants from coming into the country till we get this figured out what's going on. And everybody lines up against him. And you know what? People say, you know what? 60-some percent of the American people that have been polled agree with him. And so they say, I like that guy. And everybody else takes the politically correct position. And by the way, for your information, back in 1976, Jimmy Carter stopped all the immigrants from Iran when we had the Iran hostage crisis. He stopped them all and would not let him come in and out. He wasn't called a bigot and a, you know, all the other names are thrown out. And I realized not only was he a different party affiliation and, and the, the press is, it didn't want to attack that, but it was a different day in which we lived in too. You have to understand that. And, and so you now, but you understand, everybody's expected to just conform and be like everybody else and be what's called politically correct. And you understand, it's going to take some courage by God's people to stand up and say, we are not concerned about being politically correct. We are concerned about being biblically correct. And we want to be true to the Word of God. And we'll thank God. Doesn't matter if they say, I can't thank God, I want to thank God. Because that's the will of God, that I thank Him. And so, but bring that into the conversation of our lives and have courage to do that. What do you get? God's favor. God likes that. So why did God favor Caleb? Because he was a servant. Why did he favor Caleb? Because he had a different spirit about him. He was different. And then number three, Caleb remained faithful. Caleb remained faithful. In Numbers 14, what, the, what he said here, because my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and here it is, he hath followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land. He hath followed me fully. I think that's another way of saying he's remained faithful. He's remained faithful to me. You see, it, it was easy when he was in that band of 12 and went in to spy out the land. Oh, that would have been easy to be faithful. When they cut down the grapes and brought the grapes back, that would have been easy to be faithful. Tell you where it became difficult is when they decided not to be faithful to God. When they decided to be talking about the giants and the fenced cities 
and all the, the, the difficulties that they were going to have and the strong nations that they'd have to fight. Then, when their faithfulness was failing, His faithfulness remained intact. That's where the rubber meets the road. The real challenge is to remain faithful. You know, for the, for the majority of Christians, oftentimes, listen, for, for the most part, it's not difficult to be faithful until everything starts falling apart. Until, as they say, Murphy's Law kicks in. Whatever can go wrong, goes wrong. Everything seems to come crashing down. Or you face the giant, and the, the, the proverbial giant that you face. Or the fenced city that you come upon that looks like you cannot conquer. Then all of a sudden, do you, do you crumble? Do you begin to waver? Or will you remain faithful? Might be sickness. Might be some of the consequences of old age. I was talking to a fellow this week. He said, you got to go to the doctor. He, he said, my hip started hurting. and So he said, I think I started compensating for that. And then my knee started hurting. And now my back hurts. And, and I said, he said, it's all that running I did when I was younger. I said, are you sure it isn't old age? <laughs> He goes, oh, I don't do old age. Well, it could be just old age. But don't give in. Don't give in to that. Listen, embrace God's favor by remaining faithful. Embrace God's favor by remaining faithful. Might be temptations of Satan that you struggle with or fight against. Don't budge, resist him. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Boy, we, we forget sometimes the, the plain commands of Scripture. He'll give you the ability to overcome. You can remain faithful. When you get over to Joshua 14 that we read this evening, you're in the last scene of Caleb's life. By this time, Caleb is... 85 years old. In his case, it really is 85 years young. He makes some amazing statements here. Just amazing. That he can go in as he did just he was 40 years old. I'm not 85. But I'll tell you, I'm, I'm not doing what I did when I was 40. Wish I could. Think about the, the, just the arthritis, you know. used to play racquetball several times a week. And man, when I just think about grabbing onto that racket, my hand hurts. It's amazing. I don't know that I could grip it and hold on to it much anymore. It's, uh, it's just the, the, the you, you don't normally, you're not able to say that I'm able to go. In. Listen, he didn't just say, I'm just strong. You know, he says, yeah, yeah, sure. No, 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 no. He says, I'm able to go to war just like I was then. He said, okay, I'm going to give you this part over here, but I want you to know that's where the giants were. And Caleb said, bring them on. Bring them on. God, God promised it to me. God's, God, God's able to do it then. God's able to do it now. He still kept his focus on God. He, he, in the twilight of his years, when he watched everybody else, 20, and young, younger that, that, or 20 years and upward, that died in the wilderness. He watched them all pass off the scene. And he remained faithful. He remained faithful to God. You know, it's a blessing to see people when they get into the twilight of their life to stay faithful to God. It's, it's a... I used to listen to Dr. Howes at pastor school and he would sometimes have different age groups stand up. You know, oftentimes when it got into the 50s and 60s and up into the, those in their 70s, there were just a few sprinkled here or there. Most of the ones who were there were young men. And I don't know whether the old ones felt like they don't need that anymore. 
I, 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 I hope it isn't because there just weren't that many that were still faithful. Remain faithful. Caleb was 85 and still going. Still being faithful. Remaining faithful. He conquered Hebron in Judah and there he conquered Deber and he was able to accomplish all that God wanted him to conquer. He did it because he was a servant, because he was different, and because he remained faithful. He's able to conquer the land and receive his inheritance. Why? Because of God's favor on his life. You think, you think everybody there? You think anybody? It, I, I would venture to say even those who were under 20, that now after 40 years, 45 years it is now, that they've got in the, into the land. Caleb was 40, now he's 85. So let's say somebody was 18, they're now 63. Do you really think there's some 63-year-olds that would stand up and say, I'm just like I was when I was 18? Give me that land? I don't think so. I think God favored Caleb. I think he was a wonder to people. I think people looked at him and thought, man, I don't believe this guy. Look at him fight. Look at him conquer. What a different guy. What a great man. Faithful Caleb. Don't hear much about him sometimes. He's always usually mentioned with Joshua because they were the two that gave the good report. But I like Caleb. Remain loyal to God, faithful to God, and he was given his inheritance. I don't know about you, but I'd like to see God do some great things through us. Y'all y'all to, to desire to God do something great through your life. And, and, and to do that, hey, it's, it's not hard. You get God's favor. Well, what, what do you got to do to get that? Be a servant. Have a different spirit. And remain faithful. And the, really the blessing of uh, being at Pastor Hood's service today. Anybody get to go? Anybody was there? Pastor Jimmy Hood and uh, Amazing Grace Baptist Church and Charity Mission for 30 some years. He known all over downtown Columbus. And what a, if you, if you had to just think, when he just listened to all the different ones that got up and said how he impacted their life, whether it was other preachers, whether it was people that had been led to Christ by him, whether it was family members that spoke about the influence he had in their life, it just kept coming back how faithful he was. How faithful he was. And he was, one preacher, I had to laugh, he told the story, he said he was with him just not, not long not long ago, within the last year, I think it was, and he said they were getting ready to have a revival at the church, and he said he's downtown, you know, and passing out tracts, and Jimmy said, he looked over at me, and he said, come on, we're going in here. He said, I looked at him and looked at that sign, and I said, Jimmy, I haven't been in a bar since I got saved. He said, you're coming in with me. And he said, I'm telling you, I haven't gone into a bar since I got saved. He said, come on, he opened the door, and in we went. He said, we walked in the door and the bartender said, hey there, preacher, how you doing? He said, hey, we're doing great. He said, got a revival coming up down in church, need all these people to come. He goes, need to put some posters up. The bartender said, well, you know what wall to put them on where they all read. So he walked back to the restrooms. He said, knock on the door. Nobody in there, went in the ladies' room, hung one up. Went in the men's room, hung one up. Then he said he went down one side of the restaurant where all the booths were and he said he talked to everybody individually and gave them an invitation and gave them a track. Tell them to come to the revival meeting. He tried to find out if they were saved. And he said he motioned to me, the other preacher with him, he said to start down the other side. <laughs> so he said, I did. So I went down one side, he went down the other side. Then when he got done, he came over to my side and told me to go to the other side and we went back down the other way. <laughs> and they got a double dose that day. He said that was Jimmy Hood. And the, uh, another pastor said he was downtown and had some business to do and he was driving and all of a sudden he saw a crowd of people standing there and 
and, and they were all standing there. It looked like somebody was preaching. And so he said, I just pulled the car up to the curb and put my window down and tried to, to look and listen. He said, and pretty soon I got a glimpse of who the preacher was. It was Jimmy Hood. He got a little crowd of people there. Listened to him lunch hour out there preaching. Nobody else there, all by himself. All five foot seven inches of them. Just preaching away. Said another guy said they were at the <laughs> uh, Columbus Blue Jackets. He liked hockey, and uh, he they said he really liked it when the fights broke out, you know. But uh, he um, he said it it's amazing. He said you know guys, he said one time there were there was, there were three of them there, and he said there were like nine guys behind him. He said and they obviously been drinking and they started using foul language. And Jimmy stood up, faced them all, and said, "I want you to quit talking that way." I don't appreciate that kind of language. And these other two guys are like, there's nine of them. There's only three of us. And, you're a little, and, he, and, he, and one guy said, there's nine of them, Jimmy. He said, you got me if something happens? And the guy said, all right, I'll, I'll help you. Well, now that's two against nine. <laughs> and the other guy said, I'm sitting there, and he asked me if I'm going to help him out. And I, and I just sat there and wouldn't say anything. I just started praying, Lord, please work this out. <laughs> Lord, don't let him be a, get in a fight here, you know. And uh, he said, turns out, at some point, he said, Jimmy got up, walked out, went to the restroom or wherever, and he said, he never came back down. He said, and God spared us from getting into a brawl that night. But uh, he, he, he said he never would put up with somebody using foul language around him. He would say something to him and, and speak up for the Lord. Just remained faithful. And uh, you know what? Uh, that's the way you want to live. You want to you wanna so live that folks can stand up when the Lord calls you home and they can say some of the things that I heard today that were said about Pastor Jimmy Hood and a great, great servant of the Lord. And uh, just like Caleb, a great servant of the Lord. A servant, a different spirit, and he remained faithful. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, we bow before you now this evening. Thank you for Caleb. Thank you, Lord, for including these things in the Bible so we could, we could be encouraged, we could be challenged by the life of Caleb. And Lord, I'm praying tonight that you would speak to the hearts of people in the room. I believe you already have. I know you've challenged my heart. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be servants. That we would have a different spirit about us. That God would be in the conversation of our life. God would be, whether it's at home, whether it's in our plans, whether it's in thanksgiving. May we not just do it here. May we do it even in front of the heathen of this world. And help us to remain faithful to you all the days of our life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. But I wonder how many folks here tonight, and usually I don't give an invitation on Wednesday night. But if you're here tonight would say, Pastor, God dealt with my heart tonight. And I sure would like to have his favor like Caleb did. I want to ask God to help me to be his servant. Help me to have that different spirit about me. And help me to remain faithful all the days of my life. I'd like to live like Caleb lived. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Would you do that? God bless you. Amen. Wonderful. I'm going to have Lisa play just a stanza, just one stanza. If you want to come and pray this evening, I want you to come and pray. Ask God to do, do that work in your heart. Would you do that while she plays?
sing that with her. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Say standing just for a minute. Read this name here for you, Diane. You can fill the rest out in a minute. Just let me get it. We're glad to have Sandra Logan. Sandra, let's see, when did you move here, Sandra? September 1st. And uh, uh, she, your, is it your daughter that is at the Evans Center? And that's how Leanne knew her and invited her to come. And her mom went to uh, New Beginnings Baptist Church in uh, Baltimore, right? Baltimore, Ohio. And um, so she came to visit and uh, been coming ever since. And uh, what a blessing she's been. And uh, got her spot right over there where I know where she is and whether she's here. And she's coming to be a member of the church. Isn't that good? That's a blessing. And uh, Sandra, we're glad to have you. She'll come by transfer from New Beginnings Baptist Church. And all those in favor of welcoming her into the fellowship of our church, let it be known by an eye. Aye. And opposed by like sign. Okay, we're good. That's great, Sandra. We'll, uh, we'll have... You take her to the back there so folks can greet her as they go out and welcome her to the family. All right, that's wonderful, Sandra. That's great. Amen. All right. Um, if you have not signed up for the Christmas dinner and you want to go, make sure you see Carol tonight. I got an email today. They want a fi final count, so I got to give that to them. And uh, if, <clears throat> if, they're just, if it's just a matter of your finances, okay, that's all it is. And you see Brother Moreland, he'll take care of it for you. And uh, <laughs> he'll probably tell you to come see me is what he'll do. But that's, uh, seriously, we don't want that to keep you, all right? And, uh, and by the way, I need to, well, I just, just thought about that. Brother uh, Parrish, I need to see you for a second after church, okay? All right. You're not in trouble, by the way. All right, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you, Lord, for Sandra. Thank you, God, for working in her life, Lord, and, and bringing her our way. We see your hand in it all. Lord, I pray we'll be a, a, a blessing and encouragement to her as we serve you together here. Lord, thank you for meeting with us tonight. Thank you for Caleb and the helpful and the blessing, the challenge he's been to our lives this evening. Now, Lord, help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to go from this place and may others see Christ in our life. And we'll thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Well, it's wonderful. Isn't he wonderful? That's what we'll sing. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Hey, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir, come right on up. <laughs>